Tonight, I just want to talk to you about the new frontiers of design. And that's a way of thinking about design in a very broad sense. You know, I like to say that architecture is a branch of design and not vice versa. Design is a really all-encompassing way of building, way of constructing, way of thinking about the world. And it acts at different scales and on different platforms. And tonight, I want to show to you that these platforms are all connected by dividing and uh, ordering the lecture not by types of design. You know, today we were talking and we were thinking of how many labels uh, the world wants to give different forms of design. And instead, I'm going to talk about design by attitudes and show how these attitudes that are interesting for us just range all over many different types of design. So the first slide that I'm going to show you is um, a slide that I stole or borrowed, actually. I have their permission from my friends uh, uh, Tony Dunn and Fiona Raby. Tony Dunn and Fiona Raby are two great friends, and they're considered kind of the parents of speculative design. What is speculative design? Speculative design is a branch of design that thinks of the possible consequences in the future of our choices of today. So you'll see some of it during my presentation. But what matters most is that by thinking about the future and the plausible futures, some of these designers, like Tony and Fiona, have also started rethinking the way we uh, should consider design. For instance, if you see this slide, it talks about how design used to be in the past and how it is today, the design that we're most interested in. So you know that in the past, one of the most uh, repeated cliches about design is that it was problem solving. It still is sometimes, but sometimes it's also problem finding. It's the job of designers sometimes to help all of us frame problems and frame questions in a smart way, as opposed to just acting on what we think is a problem. I know that this is very theoretical, but as we go in the presentation, you'll see more and more of it. All, every different line of this slide is interesting, and we could do a whole lecture on it. I'm not going to do that for you tonight, but it's really quite interesting to think of how design has changed from what we used to think it was. There are still people in this world that think that design is cute chairs or cars or posters. I deal with a lot of them also within the museum. But slowly but surely, people like Don and so many of you in the audience are changing what we think design is. And we are making sure that people understand that design is not only making things pretty, but it's, it's a political act, it's a technological act, it's, a, it's an act of humanity. It is about living together and it's about the artifacts that we create so that we can inhabit the world. And by artifacts, I also mean the digital ones. Design is the ATM machine screen that you cannot stand because it always gives you ads that you don't want to use when you're trying to get your account balance. And design is also the boarding pass that you either print or you get sent to your phone. So all of that is also design. And that's what we try to explain at the Museum of Modern Art with the different acquisitions and the different exhibitions. So, Let's start this kind of survey of contemporary design looking at the different characteristics that we expect from it. So contemporary design is often critical. Being critical means having a questioning attitude towards the world and not just simply taking for granted what already exists. Sometimes the criticism is overt, but still it's always with a goal. This is a beautiful poster by Volontaire, which is a Dutch uh, graphic design company for Amnesty International. It's about female genital mutilation, and it was meant to be spread around, the, uh, around countries that have female genital mutilation. So on the one hand, it had to be explicit, but on the other hand, it had to be explicit in a way that could still not be completely rejected. And you see the subtlety of this criticism. Sometimes criticism is about being able to reach your goal without being overtly provocative, even though this was. And in other times, criticism is about highlighting issues. We were talking about problem finding. Finding the problems that we need to tackle. 
This is a great um, visualization design by a lab at Columbia University in New York. It's called Million Dollar Blocks. And Million Dollar Blocks is actually um, uh, the name of blocks in cities in the United States where the government spends more than a million dollars a year to keep some of the inhabitants of the block either in prison or in halfway houses. So it's about, it's almost like um, uh, 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 an index of entropy, of social entropy, right? And in New York alone, in Brooklyn alone, there's, there's more than 300 of these blocks, right? So you can read it in the newspaper in the morning and you read these, these lines and it might outrage you to think that that's how much we spend not to reintegrate people in society. Uh, but then you forget in 20 minutes. If instead a, a designer comes and draws this black map of Brooklyn with the, the blocks in blood red, you will remember it forever, it'll stay with you. Not only, it becomes, we were talking before about the aesthetic sense. This is also quite beautiful, a map. It's not only uh, incisive. And I have to tell you, this is in the collection of MoMA. And uh, uh, I have seen some of the youths that are represented in this map come to MoMA because of special programs that, uh, that the museum has together with the uh, city of New York, and all of a sudden be stunned to see their lives represented on the wall of the museum. Now, that couldn't happen if it had been an article from the New York Times, right? So design not only highlights, but also is able to mirror life sometimes in a more uh, truthful and in a more incisive way. So the criticality there relies also in this subtle activism. Design often is activist, at least the design that I'm interested in. But activism is not of the old kind. It's not about just you know, screaming and shouting and protesting, even though I appreciate that a lot too. But it's an activism that is sometimes about subverting the way you think of uh, the world as it was. You know, for instance, people with so-called disabilities. I mean, not having a limp is still a problem. It, the, the world is made for people with four limbs. But at least you cannot show it as a complete weakness, but rather as an opportunity for a statement to be made. I know that it's hard to think, but having a sculptor like Sofia de Oliveira Barata make your artificial limb into a superhero limb can give you a little bit, at least, of an attitude advantage. And there is this beautiful series of prostheses, Ico, that are for children. And this little kid is with other so-called normally abled children around him, and he's picking the pieces that he wants his superhero arm to be with. And the Ico prostheses are also equipped with all the slots for Lego pieces, so you can also insert Legos. And you should see the other five kids looking at him almost with envy, which is absurd to think. And he's like, like rolling around his arm, his limb, and he makes noises and it has lights. So um, there's a, a way to be activist in design that is so subtle. But it also has to do a lot with communication. Uh, form, the form of design, the elegance, the aesthetic intention, you notice I don't say beauty because also punk or also brutalism is a form of aesthetic intention, is also means of, a means to communicate. That's why I still expect and I still look at objects when I consider them for the museum from an aesthetic viewpoint. It might seem old school, but I like to think that beauty is everybody's right, that a beautiful object should not cost more, cost more than an ugly one. And I don't mean that beauty is prettiness. I mean that beauty means that the designer put some effort into the aesthetic aspect of the object, as opposed to being lazy and thinking that we are not worth it, to quote a very old slogan that was once reserved for women. Um, communication is important, and uh, communication sometimes is between people or between people and objects, and sometimes it's with, with the gods. I really love it when I can find uh, objects that take something as old as our need to have religion in our life and bend it 
to insert the technology of today. These are two objects that are actually in the MoMA collection. They both came from an exhibition called Talk to Me that was about the communication between people and objects. The one on the left-hand side is for Catholic nuns that are in a cloistered monastery in Northern England. And the one on the right is instead a prayer mat for Muslim, uh, for Muslim believers. So, this one on your left-hand side um, is connected to the BBC News, and it's almost like a ticker tape, the one you would have in Times Square. These nuns are really cloistered. They don't get the news. They only get them from this little object, and they look at what's going on in the world, and then they know what to pray about. And it, it, they, say, they say that it really keeps their prayers pertinent. What I love, the design touch, you know, the design touch is that these designers that are actually in the central, in Goldsmiths University in London, they did not go all out and made something in aluminum that looks like a flying saucer. They thought of the nuns. That looks like an altar object. I also like that sensitivity. And on this side, you see a prayer mat that has an electroluminescent substrate and a compass module. So the compass module makes the carpet light up when it's set in the direction of Mecca. Now, we don't need uh, a compass to tell us where Mecca is. We all know it. But still, it's this gesture of technology that's bowing to the divinity that I find really quite beautiful. Whether I believe in God or not, I appreciate that gesture by the designers. Or another form of communication, um, very overt, but still look at the form and understand these are superior designs because they are able to make everything come together, is this wind map, which is by Fernanda Viegas and Martin Wattenberg. They're two very well-known visualization designers. This is online. You can go and look at it anytime you want. It shows the wind uh, pattern over the territory of the United States at any time. It's national weather forecast data, so it's all official, it's all correct. But it's beautiful because you see that the wind is caressing the United States as if it were a wheat field. You can also go back into the archives and look at like big meteorological events, you know, Katrina or Sandy, and see how they formed. Um, and you see, this is really at the same time beautiful and and very and correct and open to everybody, understandable by everybody. This is when design really is good. Um, and that's the kind of synthesis that often uh, I'm looking for and we're looking for at MoMA. Um, we're also looking for design that is able to bring together the most old fashioned way, the crafts way to make objects with a more uh, intelligent and sometimes artificially intelligent way. And thinkering is a beautiful word that was coined by John Seeley Brown, that was the director of Xerox Park, you know, the Par Palo Alto Research Center where so many great innovations happened and were invented but never put to fruition in the market. So the mouse, the graphic user interface, it was a wonderful dream place uh, that could never really monetize amazing discoveries, and God bless them for that. Um, you know, um, the sometimes thinkering is not necessarily done with the hands, but it's done also with a 3D printer, and not necessarily is it always benign and for the betterment of society, or maybe not according to our idea of the betterment of society. This particular object was crucial for me because it, uh, it kind of threw me in a little bit of a crisis that generated a project that I'm really proud of. Uh, the project is Design and Violence, and we'll talk about it later. And uh, the project here that you see, the, the object that you see here is the 3D printed gun. I'm, sorry, I'm sure that many of you have heard about it. Uh, basically, Cody Wilson is um, a Texan libertarian thinker and activist. He is really super smart, and uh, uh, he decided that at some point he wanted to really challenge the idea of open source by releasing these files that anybody could access online to print with a 3D printer the components, and you see the components over there, for a gun. So you could print it almost at home. You needed a, a kind of a better 3D printer than the maker bought one, but you know, still feasible, and the gun is lethal. And I remember that I was really stunned by the moral quandary that it set, um, that it set up. And also, I was really stunned because 
being such a technocrat, I thought that technology was always good, and that was very naive. But this is a form of thinkering, we'll talk about it later, a form of thinkering that I find incredibly interesting. Thinkering is also a very old school um, idea of doing with what you have, making out of necessity. Martino Gamper is an Italian designer that lives in London. And uh, uh, one of his first projects, you see it's from 2007, was this 100 chairs in 100 days. So he went around London and every day he would pick up stuff and every day he would do a chair for 100, for 100 days. And uh, it's just a beautiful, quite poetic gesture. And Martino has gone on doing things like this, um, putting together repair shops um, outside of big department stores in Milan and elsewhere. But this was a, a beautiful gesture that brought us back to the beginning of design, in a way, which is putting things together with what's available, and even more so, chairs. It's very interesting because sometimes people ask me if I still acquire chairs and you know yeah maybe one a year but it's not maybe it's my problem but also um, chairs have ceased to amaze us in many cases except you know when you have these kind of uh, new ideas that are tested. Thinkering sometimes is also uh, thinking up new ideas that are made directly with our body and that really make us think deeply about possible consequences. This is a, a speculative design um, example, for instance. I was telling you about speculative design. Well, this is one. This is cheese that is made using bacteria as starters, bacteria from human beings. So uh, Cristina Gapakis is a bio designer. Cecil Tolas is a scent artist and a scent expert. And they took swabs from people. I mean, there are several people, but the one that I can remember is Hans Ulrich Obrist, you know, the, the curator. There was a swab. I Thing from his armpit, and then they made cheese out of Hans Ulrich Obrist. Yeah, I know it's disgusting, right? <laughs> so you're gonna remember it. And then the, the beautiful thing is that this was done at the Science Gallery in Dublin, and uh, it was an exhibition that was called Make Your Own. <laughs> and yeah, there were many other things. And in Ireland, there's a law. So people could not taste each other's cheese. They were supposed to taste only their own cheese. But they kind of like, you know, there was this underground cheese swapping thing going on. <laughs> Sorry, it's disgusting, but it's like important to know. But in a way, it's, uh, it's, you, it makes you think. Doing things makes you think. And it makes you also, it helps you construct a different world and a different theory of the world. There's this idea of, I mean, constructing can be very literal, and it can be instead much more theoretical. This is a, a, an example of a design that, okay, in this case it's fashion, but Nervous System, the company that made this dress, also makes jewelry. You might have seen their jewelry because it's sold in many museum stores, and it's those kind of 3D printed uh, necklaces and rings. So they formed a whole company out of that, and they come out of MIT, so they're wonderful nerds that were able to really monetize their nerds in a beautiful way. And uh, this, this um, garment that you see here is in the museum collection. And of course, it's really interesting. It has all the features that we're dreaming of in the future. You, you can scan your own body, then you can go online as the person that is gonna wear the, the dress and you can customize the dress and you can decide the tessellation. If the tessellation is finer, it drapes more, otherwise you can make it more rigid with bigger tessels. But what is really interesting is that um, usually when you 3D print an object, the bigger the object, the more you have to pay because you need a bigger 3D printing machine, a bigger vat of resin. It's just a more cumbersome and, and bigger process. And instead, kinematics is the uh, technique that Jessica and Matt have uh, developed to print things folded. So all of a sudden, you can print a whole dress in pretty much this big of a printer, and you print it folded, and then you extract from the 3D printer as if it were a washing machine, and it unfolds. So there's something really quite beautiful about the coming together of inventiveness and science and, uh, uh, and the need to push the way we build and construct things further. And you can see the application of these can be, uh, can be many. 
Skylar Tibbetts uh, has an, a laboratory at MIT. So it's about buildings of all scales, from full-fledged buildings to small entities that can build themselves by just giving them a hint, almost like an algorithm, and then the building grows by crystallization or by other means. And it's, a, it's the idea of reaching a new phase in our uh, eternal quest for a truly organic design. You know, we'll get to that also. But it's beautiful to see how many of these designers and scientists are coming together to develop new ways to build and new ways to construct that marry deep science and great technology with an aesthetic sense that is respectful of us as human beings as opposed to just being a solution to a problem that sometimes does not even exist. And here is where we're going to talk more about organic design. Interestingly, organic design has been the holy grail for designers, architects, engineers throughout history. Why? Because nature does it best. It builds best. It dissolves and destroys and recycles best. And it is also the greatest of the art of artists. So we've been trying forever to imitate nature. And uh, organic has meant different things in different moments of history. And I see it if I look at the collection of MoMA. I mean, the, classic, the most classical way to think of organic design is the imitation of nature formally. But then there's also the imitation of nature from a structural, infrastructural, and systemic viewpoint. And last but not least, the imitation of how nature builds and how it builds just as much as necessary. So uh, many, many designers and engineers are right now looking even more at nature. And the computer has brought us closer to building uh, in a truly organic way than we've ever been. I'm showing you here an example of something from the MIT Media Lab Tangible Group, which is a, a new neoprene-like kind of fabric that has these fins that open up as we sweat because they absorb moisture by using something that is derived from natto, from fermented soybeans. So the more one exercises and sweats, the more it opens up, almost as if you were the skin of a reptile. And also at the MIT Media Lab, I love very much this, uh, this project by Neri Oxman, which is called Silk Pavilion. And this truly is a new phase in the idea of organic design. So Neri and her uh, team observed and studied the behavior of silkworms given certain conditions of light and temperature and also some geometric conditions. They observed it and then they transformed it into algorithms that would enable them to set the conditions for thousands, for dozens of thousands of silkworms to build the pavilion that you see there over, uh, over some days. So in this case, it's really about integrating nature in the making. Can it be um, any more organic? It's the silkworms that are the contractors or the construction workers that make things happen. So this is a metaphor or a hint for how things could be built in the future, a real integration of natural methods and, well, not natural methods, a real integration of nature and uh, instead our uh, new methods that we will find in order to build objects that hopefully will be more integrated into the life cycle and into the ecosystem. Organic design, though, at some point in the, uh, in, in the MoMA collection was meant uh, as a, an organization, interpersonal organization, and, and a way to express relationships between human beings and also between human beings and their environment. And I consider this beautiful project as another form of organic design because it shows the evolution of a friendship between two women that are also two great visualization designers. So you have on the one hand, Georgia Lupi, and on the other hand, Stephanie Pozovic, one living in New York, the other living in London. Visualization design is a little bit what I showed you before. So it's usually design that takes a set of data that can come from any kind of source, from you know, the government or from um, a bioengineering lab, and then renders this data in a way that is comprehensible and usually visual. So it's about using the computer in most cases, even though it's as old as humankind. And it's about usually rendering digital data sets into another digital artifact. So this is what these two women do in general. But when they met, 
they decided that they wanted to become friends, but they were far away. Of course, they could talk on the phone, they could Skype, they could exchange all sorts of digital artifacts. And instead, they decided to exchange one postcard a week on both sides, hand-drawn, that would take data sets from the week before, and they would decide what kind of data they would gather, whether it was food or whether it was how many times they cried, and then they would send it to each other across the ocean. It's quite beautiful because it is, um, at the same time, a very natural evolution of a friendship and also a nice post-digital touch um, that we then collected into, into MoMA's collection also. I'm showing you a lot of artifacts that are in the collection. And then, Politics is also something that we should look for in uh, design. Now, when you grow up in Italy or in Greece or in France, in those places where people talk on top of each other, um, you know, <laughs> politics is everywhere and they teach you that everything that is outside of the family nucleus is politics. So, you know, I found it that it's very different here in the United States. People think that talking politics is almost rude. So I'm always careful, but I mean politics in that way, just like living together, you know, the social construct. So there are some, uh, some objects that are overtly political. I don't know if you've ever seen this Ronald Rael and Virginia San Fratello, the border wall as architecture, 2015, ladies and gentlemen. And it was meant to be like a critique of what a border could be. And uh, the interesting thing is that these people are now are asked everywhere to give talks, even though theirs was a criticism of the possibility of a border wall. And uh, I, you know, I just thought it was ironic that this happened. And this was also in the design and violence project that I'll, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about design and violence now. Um, for, have, after having seen the 3D printed gun, I was so flabbergasted that I decided to make a collection of objects that have an ambiguous relationship with violence, okay? So the ambiguity of the 3D printed gun is the idea that it's open source. So if we can share anything, why couldn't we share the files for a gun? And the same thing, the ambiguity here is that there is a sarcasm, there's like, you know, not taken, you know, it, it's kind of making um, light of the uh, harshness and the hardness of and the heaviness of a border wall. And then look at that, uh, two years later, it's almost becoming reality. Politics is also, um, communicating among individuals. And today I was talking to the students of the design lab here at UCSD, and I spoke about this, which is probably one of my favorite objects. And if you want to mention an object that got, that got me into trouble, this is, you know, the video games were nothing. This got me into trouble. Uh, <clears throat> so this, this is a beautiful object, in my opinion. It's a menstruation machine, as you can read from the caption. It is this contraption that you see here, uh, and it's almost like a chastity belt. And it's meant for men or other, um, uh, other entities and that, uh, that have never tried having a menstruation, for them to try a full-fledged period. It has, it has electrodes that come low on your abdomen and give you cramps, and then... <laughs> Yep, there's a reservoir in the back and you're supposed to draw your blood, put it there, then there's a cannula that delivers in between your legs. So it's the full Monty. It's really like the whole thing. <laughs> and um, I, the first time I saw it, I was so moved by it. The designer, and she's a designer and not an artist because she calls herself a designer. So at this point, it's about the cards that she declare. The designer is Sputniko. Her name is Hiromi Ozaki. The, um, the stage is the Royal College of Art in London, the Design Interactions Program, which was used to be the foremost speculative design center uh, until a few years ago. And uh, uh, Hiromi is a mathematician, but then she became a designer in London. When she is back in Japan, she's a pop star. So she has all these followers because of her music. And she always starts with the object, but then she models the object. So you see her there, but she's dressed as a guy, Takashi. And the guy is wearing the menstruation machine. And then she makes these artworks and she also makes a song and a little video. So there is, if you wanna find it, you can go Sputniko, you'll find it online, in which Takashi struts around town wearing the menstruation machine with his friend who is a woman and she's singing, it hurts, right? And it's gonna hurt even more, you know? So it's really, it's such a, 
um, and I, I was really moved by it. It's, a, it's an object that is truly the best speculative design because it will not leave you indifferent. Either you love it or you're repelled by it. And if you're repelled by it, you also get angry, and that's what happened. Um, but to me, it was really moving because it's an attempt to, uh, to do politics, to kind of build one of the final bridges. You know, menstruation is a real barrier in so many cultures, and it's one of the last ways to really divide gender. So not to mention all the different issues, you know, with the, the design of the contraceptive pill that was designed so as to leave the period in even though it was not necessary. There's so many implications. So I was really touched by this. Uh, by the way, Sputniko Hiromi right now is a professor at the MIT Media Lab. For some reason, there are some schools that are recurrent in my work, in my professional life. And, uh, uh, and it's amazing to see how schools have become the defining points in the new geography of design. You know, once upon a time, it used to be when design was chairs and cars, it used to be the factories, and usually the factories were the poles. Then um, in a, in a post-industrial era, it became the places where the branding and the marketing happened. And right now, even that is dispersed, so schools are the only anchors that are left on the territory, interesting. Design like that is also visionary. And uh, visionary means really to think of what the world will be in the future. So that's where speculative design also comes into play. Ai Hasegawa is uh, uh, a pupil of, of Hiromi's. So she's at the MIT Media Lab. And this is another example of uh, speculative design. In this case, um, I chose a couple of gay women that live in France. One is Japanese, the other is French. They've been together for a long time. And she hypothesized the two women having children uh, by complete parthenogenesis without having any um, man or sperm involved. It's completely, it's not possible yet. Maybe we'll get there in the future or maybe never, but it was a way to test the situation. It was more testing at, at the level of the couple, at the level of this interestingly um, uh, kind of vulnerable, but at the same time strong relationship between the two women. And what I did is she created a whole scenario. Sometimes speculative design is about building scenarios. And she made a whole book and a video with the children that were like photoshopped into the book and created, like she created this whole scenario and then presented the book to the couple and filmed what happened. And the documentary was first screened on NHK, which is the national television in Japan. And uh, it created a very interesting and uh, surprisingly not controversial from the viewpoint of being outraged or anything else, but just a very interesting discussion, more on the nature of having children or not having children than on the nature of being gay and wanting children in a completely autonomous way. So uh, all of these projects are about really, think about it, that human cheese and the menstruation machine and the scenario, this is when speculative design is good, when it really is raising interesting question and raising them with impeccable form adding something in your life also. But sometimes the vision remains very anchored to the ground. And I love to contrast the impossible child that you saw before with instead what happened in Windsor County in North Carolina. Emily Pilaton and Matthew Miller formed Project H. Project H was born several years ago when these two dewy-eyed, wonderfully idealist graduates of CCAC at that time, now CCA, decided that they wanted to help the world. So the first thing that they did wanting to help the world from Northern California was to redesign one of the most uh, stable and old fashioned staples of South of Africa and in South Africa in particular, which is the water hippo that you see over there, also called hippo roller. The hippo roller enables um, women and children, because usually it's women and children in communities in Africa to carry more water than they did before from the street up to the village, because you know that's what uh, many of them do. And the hippo roller is very simply something that you roll with a big cap and that you can bring up the hill. 
Now, Matthew and Emily saw that it was not perfectly rational because the two parts that were rotation molded were not symmetrical, so they needed two different molds and then the shipment didn't work fine. I mean, they wanted to redesign it the way a problem-solving uh, Western American designer would do it. They did not take into account that there's an ecosystem there and that two different factory owners survived because the two parts were molded differently. They did not realize that if the shipment was more cumbersome, it meant that more people got to be paid for shipping. So it was a whole set of uh, uh, ignorant uh, pres presumptions that were done with the best of intentions, but that made the project fail. Now, Intelligent as they are, they understood, and so the next time around, they moved to North Carolina, they stayed there for a year, and they worked with the community that at first snubbed them and thought that they were, you know, idealist San Franciscans, living actually even worse in Half Moon Bay, uh, that would go there and help them redesign their lives. But after a year, after a year, what Matthew and Emily did was to give people a sense of purpose and of pride. And at the end, a new farmer stand was built by the people in the community. And also they started building this new type of chicken coop that was also sold to other villages around. Um, there's something that's very different, even though you might detects still a little bit of like wanting to help the world uh, from a position of superiority, but not necessarily so, because at least they tried to understand the context, which is sometimes what it takes when you want to really have vision and to also be responsible. Uh, a sense of responsibility in design is very important. Uh, responsibility towards other human beings, of course, that's what designers should do, but also responsibility towards the environment, responsibility towards history, just responsibility, period. And sometimes this can happen in multifaceted ways. I really like the work of Forma Fantasma. Forma Fantasma are two Italian designers that um, went to the Academy of Art and Design at that time, now it's only design in Eindhoven, in Holland. Uh, Simone and Andrea, these two designers, have been mining Italian material culture and trying to find old school, old ways to make things that could be particularly relevant today. So uh, sometimes with really interesting results. This series that you see here is called Botanica. And it's an attempt to recuperate resins from the pre-oil era. So they worked with this foundation in Sicily to understand how one could remake um, resins that are made out of beeswax and straw or shellac, you know, just very, very natural materials. And so this idea of recuperating the past and teaching it to to in the present so that the future can be um, better, um, the better constructed is very interesting. Responsibility is also thinking of parts of society that are usually uh, considered really left aside. We were talking before about the million dollar blocks and the different reintegration attitude that happened around the world. This is the prison in Norway where the famous uh, criminal that killed 80 people on the island is uh, held. And you know, it's very different from a max security prison that we see here. And maybe it's not the model that we need because maybe we feel that a little more punishment should be given to somebody that killed 80 people than 23 years. But whatever you think, still there is this um, the philosophical attitude that one needs to have, like how do you feel about imprisonment and what, how can design help realize a different point of view by constructing either a maximum security prison or a place of internment and re-education. So it's fascinating to see that responsibility can be meted out differently. And sensitivity is also quite important in so much design. I remember the first time I saw death being really considered by designers and especially by a design school. And it was at the Salone del Mobile in Milan, the furniture fair. And it was the Design Academy Eindhoven again. It was a whole course for the whole year the students had worked on death. And it was a beautiful installation that happened in a beautiful palace in Milan where you had like 30 different objects that were all about dying, being dead, funeral banquets. And uh, 
it, it was there that I realized that design should really be interested in parts of our life that usually are left aside and not considered at all. So just um, about uh, a month ago, I did a whole salon about death. But now, you know, death is much more uh, normal to be talked about these days. There's a uh, Caitlin McDoughty that is uh, in Los Angeles that is a designer that has become quite well known because she, she took a funeral license and she started doing completely different funerals and completely different ways of uh, talking about death. But so <clears throat> this kind of sensitivity, thinking of all parts of life and not only of the easy, not only fair weather designers, but you know, really seriously considering also the most uncomfortable ones. Or um, this is another project that I love that is very, very sensitive. It's about human trafficking, and in particular, it's about women trafficking. It's a project by a group of students that takes into consideration the fact that the only time when trafficked women are by themselves, if they're lucky enough as not to have um, guardians that are women, is the bathroom. So they hid all of these different instructions, emergency phone numbers, ways to escape inside sanitary pads packaging. So. Very interesting. In, in this particular case, once again, I, we're not talking about prettiness here, but the form is the communication, so clarity and, uh, and really this kind of ingenuity of thinking sensi sensi sensibly and sensitively where this communication can happen. Sensibility is also very important, but sensibility manifests itself in many different ways and sometimes doesn't really work out. So this is the work of Masoud Hassani. He was a graduate at the Academy of Eindhoven. Um, when he graduated, he was 27. He grew up in Afghanistan, in northern Afghanistan, in an area that had a lot of minefield, that had seen a lot of war, so it, there were still a lot of landmines. And he remembered that when he was a child, together with his brother and their friends, they would play by making this rolling toys that were made of paper that would be carried by the wind. But sometimes these toys, they would race these toys, but sometimes these toys would end up in the landmines, in the, in the minefields, so they knew that they couldn't go and retrieve them, because otherwise, you know, they, they were children, but they knew better. Um, so when he had to actually think of his thesis project, he decided to go and dig into his childhood, and he decided to do a mine detonator that was a rolling object. He tried to make it light enough, and he didn't really make it. It's made of bamboo, which is, you can find all over the world, but the feet and the central core that are in rotation molded plastic make it not light enough as to be carried by the wind, but you can roll it. And the problem is an old one. You know, it takes nothing to put landmines down, but it takes thousands of dollars to pick them up because you need equipment, because you need um, all sorts of uh, safety measures. So he was trying to find a, a kind of inexpensive way and sustainable way that, that could be exported all over the world and that could be actually built all over the world. And even though this did not work, uh, was not scalable enough, it still is a beautiful example of an attempt to be sensible while at the same time building on one's own uh, life experience. Um, I also like very much this quite recent project by Baibore, which is a, a, a Dutch outfit. Uh, they decided to do new habits for the Dominican order of preachers. They were commissioned by the Dominicans, and why not? I mean, really, once again, areas of life that we haven't thought about. And this year, since I'm doing for the first time uh, an exhibition that deals with garments and fashion, I'm learning so much about, once again, all of these undiscovered different pockets that are uh, truly fascinating. Pragmatic. Um, pragmatic. Some design is still very pragmatic, not all of it, but some, I think, I like to think that even the most speculative of design is pragmatic because it is about helping us live and about being practical in its imaginative ways. But in some cases, pragmatism is really, really center focus, uh, as is very often in scientific equipment or medical equipment. I really love these organs on chips from the Wyss Institute, which is a, an institute at Harvard that also collaborates with MIT. These are meant to mimic the behavior of certain bodily organs and are used to bypass certain steps in pharmaceutical testing. So um, they kind of speed up 
the whole testing and they use a mixture of like nano technology and silicon chips and computer modeling so it's a it's a hybrid form of modeling but um, they are quite beautiful in their uh, absolute practical way you know they really are meant to function in a certain way and nothing more and that's what i like um, also interesting and, and controversial was the pragmatism of uh, Elemental Chile. Elemental is an architectural office and actually Alejandro Ravena, who's one of the principals, won the Pritzker Prize, I think it was last year, two years ago. The Pritzker Prize, as you might know, is the biggest award given in architecture and it's usually given to big star architects. And instead, Elemental was well known for this kind of work, which is not really what you would expect. It's not the Disney Concert Hall, it's not the Centre Pompidou. It's actually almost like a starter for a community. It's an architecture that is completely selfless. Um, in Chile, the state gives people who need it a once-in-a-lifetime subsidy for them to, to buy and build a home. So basically, let's say one of these homes costs $20,000, the person needs to put at least $500 down that needs to be a, a personal investment, but the other 19,500 19, are given by the government. And people can buy these starter homes. They're basically, that are designed by Elemental. They're basically two floors, just the basics inside, yeah. the pipings and the plan, implants and the infrastructure that you need. And they are ready for you to add whatever you want. You know, you can add a lodge, you can add a balcony, you can add another floor, depending on when you make money and how. And they're already built around a cul-de-sac, which is the beginning, beginning of a community. And it's interesting that um, an architecture of this kind was taken into account for the Pritzker Prize. Of course, they did much more, but it, there is a pragmatism that really I find very fascinating. But a lot of design, just like us today, is ambivalent and ambiguous, and that's um, a characteristic that I've learned to praise and appreciate. Uh, there's some quantum quality or conceptual quality to it. This project I find very conceptual. It's fashion, because now I'm learning about fashion, but it's not your normal kind of fashion. It's Mary Ping, which, uh, who runs a company called Slow and Steady Wins the Race in New York, and she's really quite amazing. So this is the white t-shirt project, but you see she did a white t-shirt in black pan velvet, or the white t-shirt in, uh, in damask or in black lace. So it's this idea that sometimes the design are concepts and they can be then magnified and they can be multiplied and they can be manifested in many different ways. Or another side, another type of ambivalence and ambiguity is, for instance, this uh, synthetic bacterium, a bacteriophage, that we just acquired in the collection of MoMA. It's the old bacteriophage that we all know about, Phi X174. It's, been, it's become the uh, workhorse of uh, biology for many different years, but in this particular case, it's the company Autodesk that is the company that we know for having uh, generated all of the uh, 3D printing and then before that also architectural modeling that actually designed this new software that enables one to create bacteria in a much faster way using software as if you were a 3D printing for bacteria. And interestingly, well, first of all, the ambiguity is it's a little scary about, uh, you know, be thinking that this could happen. And actually, Andrew Hessel, who's the scientist at Autodesk that made this happen, also wrote a beautiful paper that talked about hacking the president's DNA. Actually, he wrote it a few years ago, so he was not talking about this president, but the one before. <laughs> and. Uh, but it's the ambiguity, uh, that the moral ambiguity, that is particularly interesting about this. And so if you put everything together and you look at all these different objects, many of them share all these characteristics. They are political, they are ambivalent, they are pragmatic and activist, they are critical. In a way, that's the kind of design that we are looking for at MoMA and that I think so many of us here that are interested in design also 
look for with their antenna when they try to get inspiration and to think of what's really worthwhile. And there are some objects here that you uh, haven't seen in the presentation, but they share the same characteristics. The way we go about it is um, at the museum is by, of course, having exhibitions and then by adding them into the collection. Now, exhibitions are wonderful because you can have an idea and then you can find the objects that support that idea. And the idea is stronger than anything. So the objects are all participating in a choral way to build that particular thesis. And instead, when it comes to the collection, it's a little more complicated because the objects have to be self-standing. So um, many people ask, what are the criteria for the objects that go into the collection? Some are very old school, form and function. Hey. We're still there, form and function. But form has changed and function has changed. So what's changed is the manifestations of form and function. Um, but behavior also matters a lot today because behavior is what um, the mirroring of this object in the world and the way it makes us live together. And right now, since we're so interested in context, we cannot divorce behavior anymore from the object itself. And then there's the litmus test that sometimes we think about. You know, if you close your eyes and you think, uh, if this object did not exist, would the world miss out? And I like to say that that's very important. And it doesn't mean that it has to be something functional. I always use as an example the most unfunctional and, and kind of ridiculous of all objects, which is the Tamagotchi. Right? If the world didn't have the Tamagotchi, actually it would be kind of a pity because that was the first encounter with anguish and responsibility for so many kids. You know, once upon a time, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost like a, a growth pattern. But some of the exhibitions that you see here led us to really think of these different facets of design. This was the exhibition about the communication between people and objects. Over there, top right, was Designing the Elastic Mind, which was about design and science. So it was one of the first attempts to really frame speculative design for the collection of MoMA. And then you see here in the middle, actually, you see these like camera, security cameras. That's the work of Toro Lab. They are based in Tijuana. And uh, it was an exhibition called Safe, Design Takes on Risk, that was about design and safety. Um, besides that, you know, exhibitions about materials, exhibitions about interaction design. So slowly but surely, it's about exposing our public to different forms of design that can happen and also to the video games <laughs> and to the emojis. You know, uh, one of our latest proud acquisitions is the first set of emojis from 1999. Shigetaka Kurita is the designer and they were produced by Dokomo uh, in Japan in order to communicate with our consumers. It's very interesting because the first emojis were for, do for entity Dokomo to just let people know faster about weather forecast, phases of the moon, or other you know, promotional offers. And then it became something that we cannot live without today. So that's the installation in the atrium of MoMA. When the video games were announced, there was a big brouhaha. But it was a brouhaha that was more from the old school art world that, for some reason, is really threatened. Not everybody, but in many cases, is really threatened by design and by digital technology. And also by this crazy notion of the low trying to suffocate the high. You know, this like tide of low that is about to suffocate the high. Um, but we're very proud of having the, these objects in the collection. Sometimes um, projects don't go the way you'd like them to go. And that's why you find new ways that, that create whole new avenues and that actually end up being better. So this is the case of design and violence. So I was telling you before how, how stunned I was by the 3D printed gun when it came out. And at the same time, also a book by Steven Pinker, you know, the, uh, the Harvard um, scientist, came out called The Better Angels of Our Nature that argued that our society is becoming less violent, basically because war has changed and because there's less bloodshed. But I remember when it came out, I tried to read it. I went through a few chapters, but it's pretty heavy. But you know, I respect, of course, I was sure that Stephen would be absolutely right. But I was thinking maybe violence has changed, right? Maybe what has changed is really the way we think about it. So together with a colleague, Jamer Hunt, we put together a proposal with all these different objects that 
help us understand the way violence has changed. And we proposed it to MoMA that said, mm -mm, no. All right, no. And you know, you get a lot of rejections in our line of work, as I'm sure also in your line of work, we all get rejection. We need to learn to live with it. And sometimes you shelf the idea, other times you throw it away altogether. Sometimes instead you really think that it should happen. So Jamer and I decided to do what one does when one has no money and doesn't want to ask permission. You start a WordPress site. And, um, <clears throat> and, uh, and so every, Every week we would publish a different, we would publish a different object that had an ambiguous relationship with violence and we would ask somebody really authoritative to write about it and then we would ask a question. So we also asked Steven Pinker for instance and he wrote about it. And you see some of the objects here, the FGM posters that, that, um, that we discussed before and the Kalashnikov, then of course there was the 3D printed gun, the border wall, mountaintop removal. So it was a very wide idea of violence, but it really helped us understand a lot. And it was a very successful program that in the end became also an exhibition, just not at MoMA, but at the Science Gallery in Dublin. The next exhibition that uh, we are working on is called Items is Fashion Modern. And, uh, even though it might seem completely different from all the exhibitions before, it's always the same one. It's always the same movie that a director makes over and over again. And I realize in hindsight, it's always the same exhibition I make all over again. It's always about using design, which I find to be the highest form of creative human expression to use design to understand better the way we live and the way we can live. It's an ode to human creativity, in, a, in other words, even though it's not always pretty. Items is about the 111 items of clothing that had a strong impact on the world, for good and for bad. All of them for good and for bad, believe it or not. There's not one single item that doesn't have both facets in its own existence. Think, of, for instance, about the Ray-Ban aviators. To everyone, they signify, you know, military um, power, but then, you know, also high technology. Well, for me, for a woman that grew up in Milan in the 1970s as a, as a child, uh, the Ray-Ban aviators mean neo-fascists that I had to stay away from. So interesting. If you think about it, you could put together a list of 111 by yourself and, you know, and they would be probably overlapping with mine a lot, but also not. And if somebody did the same in, from Bangalore, the list would be much more different, but at least it's an attempt. You know, the moment you make a list, everybody wants to, uh, wants to actually contribute their own list. And some of the items are no brainers, like, you know, the little black dress, but you see that also the kinematics dress is a little black dress. But then there's the hijab, for instance, or veils and coverings. Then there's the tracksuit and how it's interpreted by this wonderful collective in South Africa called Sartist. And then, of course, there's the hoodie. And actually, there's Carmen Artigas, who is here tonight. She already participated in last May in a beautiful one day, we called it a besedario, we went from A to Z and every participant spoke for seven minutes about a different letter of the alphabet that related to fashion and to the garment industry. And actually, Carmen talked about Rana Plaza, which is the, uh, the factory that, that fell in Bangladesh um, a few years ago. So this exhibition will talk about the beauty of fashion, but it will also talk about the ugliness of fashion and it will talk about uh, the world in a way that we all understand because we all wear clothes and we all use clothes in order to express ourselves and our identity. And some of the collaborators, because we will show the items as they are, but we will also commission a few prototypes. Some of the collaborators will talk, for instance, about uh, being on a wheelchair all the time and being able to wear nice clothes even when you're on a wheelchair. This is Lucy Jones. Or they will talk about what are called stout sizes, believe it or not, in the industry parlance, plus sizes are now stout bodies. So it's a way really to also address uh, gender neutrality or instead gender identity. So it really is going to be an exhibition that I hope will reflect more on the world as other exhibitions in the past.
And that will lead us back to this uh, initial slide and to the understanding that even though things are never completely A or completely B, and even though design can still be A and be more than acceptable, the parts that are more interesting are always the ones that come from shaking things as they used to be and really working in the middle. So I really hope that designers in the future will learn to be more ambiguous and ambivalent, and more than anything, will learn to be more political and more critical even if they are making band-aids. Thank you very much.